All right, welcome everybody. This is a uh, Purple Team Exposed with Mary Sawyer. Mary is a member of the Red Team at Palo Alto Networks. In addition to her work on the Red Team to stay ahead of attackers by embracing their mentality, strategies, and tactics to test the organization's security posture, Mary is also innovating on the Purple Team program. Please welcome Mary to ShellCon 2018. Hey everybody, thanks for coming to my talk, and more importantly, thanks to all the ShellCon guys, especially the AV guys, you just saved my butt. <laughs> Okay, so just a quick show of hands. Uh, have you guys tried out purple teaming in your organizations before? Yeah? Maybe like read blog posts about it, just sort of confused on like how to actually implement it? Yeah, okay. Um, so that's kind of how we started out at Palo Alto 2. We decided that we were going to start it like uh, last year, I think, and it started out more as like an ad hoc process, but um, this year I was really able to uh, innovate on how we were doing that, and I hope to share my insights with you today. All right, so today we're going to be going over what a purple team is, if you need it or not, how you should assemble your team, some automation frameworks, and basic uh, steps for you to follow when you're trying it out in your own organization, and then we'll put it all together. So if you read all the blog posts, you're probably familiar generally with what the definition for a purple team is. It's supposed to be a framework for iterative testing to rapidly and effectively identify deficiencies within your environment. But in practice, we found that it's just two people sitting down, running tests, and developing alerts or fixes. I think it's really important for you to sit down and uh, ask yourself whether or not you actually need a purple team. I know a lot of the resources out there tell you that, of course, you should be purple teaming. Why not? It's the next gen thing. But I think it's really most useful in small to medium businesses or maybe younger security teams where you're trying to build up processes rapidly and effectively. Or maybe you're suffering from like pen test fatigue where you're getting a lot of results and not seeing a lot of improvement in your security posture. So ask your doctor if purple teaming is right for you. <laughs> so again, our purple teaming journey, uh, you, may, you may or may not have uh, attended my boss's talk last year, PJ. She was talking about red teaming, and she mentioned what we were doing on the front of purple teaming. So it started out initially as an intern project. One of our lovely and talented interns actually built us an application that was able to track our red team attacks as they were happening phases from the red team in the attack, and then the blue team could either mark things as detected or not whenever they got alerts. However, this caused some incons inconsistent communication. It was more of a battle than a real collaboration. We didn't find much um, insight for the blue team on why they weren't detecting what we were attacking on, and the red team couldn't run tests that blue team could even track reliably. So we came up with the structure for our purple teaming operations. First off, it, you should assemble a team, have two people dedicated to purple teaming. Um, it can be a less skilled person and a more skilled person, depending upon um, what resources you have at the time. I think it's a really sweet opportunity to train up junior pen testers or analysts, because you are, again, testing in a dedicated test environment. It allows them to build familiarity with, the new t with new tools from inside a controlled test environment without, where they can test things without fat fingering something, and it won't like, cause something to go down that's customer facing. And I know that scheduling can get dicey when you're working in a SOC or in a red team where you're doing an exercise. However, it really helps communications if you set up working sessions regularly so that even if you don't run any tests that week, you're discussing what you should be doing. And then we came up with this workflow for actually testing. This is obviously based on the scientific method, but we found that that was the simplest thing to get us actually get the ball rolling. First, you're going to start out with, obviously, a misconfiguration or a vulnerability in the environment. Maybe you see something that hasn't been remediated yet, or you have some niggling thing in the back of your mind where you're like, hey, are we blocking that? Or maybe you're reading about a new attack vector and you're not sure whether or not it works in your environment. First, you're going to start out by writing down what you think is wrong and then putting it into a tracking system like JIRA. 
from there, you're going to obviously do all your like backlog grooming, see what you actually want to run first. And then when you're actually running the experiments, you're going to need to, first of all, collect telemetry. On Windows, you're probably going to use Procmon, um, or on Linux or Mac, strace. You're going to actually run the test, either in the malware or like the command that you want to run. You're going to watch your seam while it's happening in real time to see if any alerts bubble up. And you're also going to be taking notes. From there, you're going to examine everything that you gathered during the experimentation phase, and you're going to determine whether the attack was a success or whether it was a failure. Now, if it was a success, obviously, we can't have that, so we need to develop an improvement. Be that an alert, a threat hunting use case, or maybe a mitigating control, like turning off SMB1, which you should do, by the way. Once you build that improvement, you want to test it. You want to make sure that if you put this into production, it's not going to like break everything or give you a million results. So you want to go through this workflow again until you have confidence that this alert or threat hunting use case isn't going to break everything. And then obviously, once you've fixed everything, you're going to report that you were successful. Another quick note about the working sessions. We all forget things when we leave work, so we should all take notes just in case we have some conflict on whether or not the attack was successful or not. Treat it like an incident or a pen test. Take the notes like you would during those phases. And obviously record where you were running it, because sometimes if you want to go back and do forensics on a system, you need to know where you did it. Before the actual first session, you're going to need a dedicated environment. So if you don't have the resources for that, maybe consider putting off Purple Team until you're in a more, more mature organization. The, so you should focus on trying to get the most common operating systems in your environment. Be that Windows Server, Ubuntu, just take your best guess. And then from there, you're going to try to get the gold or standard images from your IT system as well. If they don't have that, then just try to have them make their best guess and configure something for you. And you should also put this where your other server lives. So if you're testing any, any um, malware that beacons out, you need to actually have firewall rules in, in place so that you're not testing on a system that doesn't have any rules. As a red teamer, I love testing in production, obviously. <laughs> but our philosophy is also to tread carefully. So if you are testing on production systems, things do break sometimes, and you need to be prepared for the consequences. So on purple teaming, you try not to use the images for anything else, and you also try to use OPSEC safe tools. So for example, if you're testing PowerSploit, they have the Mayhem module, which can uh, set the master boot record on Windows systems. If you're planning on using these systems in the future for purple teaming, don't use that module. Actually read the scripts that you're running before you run them. You can also try to isolate the boxes on your network, but again, if you're testing any C2, any, any like pass the hash attack, the results may be skewed. So now you have your environment, you have your team, and you have your workflow. Now you need to actually know what test cases you want to run, what's best for your business. You want to do gap analysis using MITRE's attack framework. Pretty much everybody knows about this, but if you don't, go read it. It's basically like the InfoSec Bible at this point. Um, it's a quick way to select and prioritize your tests for impactful results. And if also a quick note, if you're a more junior analyst or a junior pen tester, you may want to bring in someone from the outside who's more familiar with the network landscape just so that you get better insights into your organization's security. So first thing you want to do is start out with the entire framework, the Mac, the Windows, and the Linux, if it applies to you. Obviously, don't put in anything that doesn't apply to your environment. So if you're not mature enough to have 2FA, for example, don't test it, because it's not going to give you any results. You can also add new TTPs that aren't mentioned. So anything that any new attack vector that you want to try out super bad, go ahead and add that in there. It's supposed to be a resource for you, and it's not actually the Bible. <laughs> so during gap analysis, you want to try to rate your organization on each category from good to worst. I've supplied this handy legend. I think that it's pretty helpful for everybody here. It, keeps, it helps you keep all your thoughts together when you're looking back at it later. 
And if you're in doubt, just move on. You don't have to rate every single category. If you don't know where you stand on something, it's probably better that you don't test it since you don't know what's going on. Let's see, you've finally gone through everything and I'm just giving this credential access column as an example. You want to select the category that you want to test first. Unless you have a really big team and the manpower to actually go through all these test cases at once, you want to keep it simple, at least for the first iteration. So the first thing you want to do is prioritize by popularity. So in this example, we see that credential dumping is used by every garden variety hacker out there. Um, it's super popular with both APTs and SCIDs, so you want to make sure that you get that out of the way first. And we're going to use the attack wiki to make test cases because it's actually a super verbose example of uh, how to build te test cases. For example, the credential dumping technique in the attack framework, it has all these different ways to dump credentials in, in Windows. We're going to take a look at the Security Accounts Manager first. So as you guys probably know, the Security Accounts Manager is just a way that it stores local accounts. There are four really common tools out there already to dump it, PWDump, GSecDump, MimiCats, and CredDump. These are four test cases that were already online for you, so you don't have to go through all the research yourself. So definitely use this as a big resource when you're purple teaming. Now that you have all those four test cases, maybe you want to go deeper and investigate what it actually takes to run MimiCats in your environment, for example. A lot of AV is kind of touch and go on how MimiCats works, so maybe try out some basic way of obfuscating it by using like a packer, for example. It's another handy tra training opportunity for red and blue alike. So going further into the Mimikatz example, have your red teamer go ahead and clone the repo, open Visual Studio, maybe remove strings from the code that a lot of AV sigs on. It's pretty well documented that at least a couple of AVs used to sig on the gentle kiwi string then go ahead and compile it and then pack it using either UPX or Thamida, whatever you have lying around. It may seem super simple to you guys, but if you have like a baby hacker on your team, this is gonna be a super useful experience for them. And let's say you decide to go further into it. You want to see exactly what it takes to run Mimikatz in your environment and you keep obfuscating it on it. Maybe stop before you start looking like that SpongeBob meme, <laughs> where it's kind of ridiculous and you don't know, you can't read it what you're running anymore. And you also want to put exactly how you obfuscated it in your um, description in JIRA or your test case um, handler. From the Bloop team side, um, obviously you want to create meaningful improvements so that you're not just like throwing darts at a board, seeing where they go. You want to start out by analyzing tele the telemetry that you collected using either Procmon or S-Trace, and you may even look f into the hacking tool and see if you can find any unique behavior there. From there, you're going to use that unique behavior to SIG on it, and then you're going to tune it going through the workflow that I mentioned earlier. I kept these suggestions super simple because a lot of tools out there are wildly different, so I don't want to give something that's like too platform-based. So congratulations, you've just finished your first purple team exercise. <laughs> Moving forward, you're probably going to start looking at, oh, what can I do to automate out some of the simple stuff because I'm lazy and I don't want to do it all myself. However, we don't have the capability to automate everything out in purple team yet. It probably is in the future, but we're, we're just going to look at some of the tools that are out there today. These are just a few that we've tried in our organization. Um, there are t I think that there are a few more out there, but I haven't tried them out yet, so I don't want to give my um, advice on those since I haven't run them. First off, we have Miners Caldera. It's a pretty cool tool that they've developed. It's only for Windows, and it does need some kind of complicated setup. You do need to dedicate a server to it, and you will need to install client rats on your purple teaming boxes. However, it does have a really sweet 
attack selection engine. But again, the setup is a pain, so maybe evaluate whether or not it's worth it for you guys. Next is the Atomic Red Team. Um, it's also really cool. It's cross-platform, which might be good for some of you people who have very uh, chaotic environments. However, you will probably need to learn Ruby or PowerShell in order to make it work. Um, but again, it does have pretty good coverage of the attack framework. And then there's RTA. RTA is pretty cool because it's just a lot of scripts that you drop onto your purple saving boxes and then run. So it's super simple. You don't even have to really know Python in order to run it. So again, trivial setup. It is only for Windows, but it does give you a really decent coverage of the attack framework. Oh, OK, cool. Nice to know. Thank you. This is the coverage of RTA currently, uh, what I see on their GitHub. Um, I went ahead and mapped this out so you guys can see it's pretty decent. It doesn't have everything yet, but if you're looking for something to automate out some of the categories that you don't want to work on or that you think are like beneath you, definitely try it out. So to sum up, just test out all the tools and select the one that works best in your environment. If you're really bored, go make one yourself, definitely, and put it out there for everybody else to use. Um, if you're running a lot of stuff in your environment, again, probably use Atomic Red Team, Pure Windows, maybe Caldera or RTA. All right. So to sum up, I think that when done correctly, Purple Team is everything it's chalked up to be. It's just a matter of doing it right. A lot of times it's complicated to bring all the resources that you see online into one vision that you can see. So use these resources that I've compiled as kind of a map for you to build your own. It, Purple Team, again, can improve your security posture. It can train your employees. It can help you learn about weaknesses in your environment. However, you must stick to measurable and repeatable processes and don't try to automate yourself into a corner. It's to be a resource to you, not to replace you. And I've compiled some resources here in case you're looking to build your own purple team or maybe improve on it. And I've put some extra material for test cases. I'll be dropping these slides to my Twitter later today and also my LinkedIn, so you can check them out there. All right, I know I, go, I'm, I, know I went through that super quickly, so if anybody has any questions, Please ask him now. Um, do you have to do uh, focus instead of exploit focus? So you give, you give one of your red teamers, like, do everything you can do with Cobalt Strike, do everything you can do with you know, uh, uh, PowerShell Empire, whatever. And then blue team against that as opposed to just individual exploits? So we did that in, initially. We ran whole, like, whole uh, red team exercises, but in a day during sort of a wargaming exercise. But we found that per, the blue team was kind of looking at the wrong tools for that, and they got kind of confused. So we decided to kind of like dumb it, not dumb it down, but like simplify it so that we could just run something, test it, run something. Yeah, like, 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 yeah. like you could you could theoretically do all of, like a whole attack chain in one day, but it might like overwhelm you. I suppose I mean picking individual features inside of a tool to focus on one. I'm not necessarily all of them at once, oh. as opposed to going through MITRE, trying to pick out some of the examples, trying to find other examples, trying to find obf obfuscation that's assigned to those that Tom maybe teach yeah. you. So it's like, because in my experience, you'll go back and forth a million times, because I'll come up with something, you know, signature, and I'll look at your signature, and then I'll figure out how to get around your signature, and it just goes. Yeah, I mean, we totally do that too during the purple team exercise. I mean, with Mimikatz, for example, I was able to like obfuscate my way around everything that the blue team was able to come up with. So there's definitely a lot of like iteration through that. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of attack framework actually is just specific tools that they say, this is bad. And then they give you test cases for it. So a lot of those tools have different applications. And I think that, I think that your example probably could be a full purple team exercise. Like, we hate po Cobalt Strike. We don't want it to run anywhere. And then you just do a purple team exercise on that. I'm just thinking, like, if you're maybe like a younger security organization, you probably don't want to tackle Cobalt Strike the first time around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is super good. Okay. How often do you do you do that? How often do you do purple team exercises? So it depends upon how long it takes us to get through one. So we really focus on 
blocking stuff or like making sure it we know what it takes to actually run something so our our first one took like one month and then our second one took three month three months because we were tackling a lot more material so it really depends upon how fast it takes you to create alerts and what roadblocks that you find. So for example, if you don't have a lot of visibility into like say PowerShell that's being run in your environment, you're probably not gonna be able to create decent PowerShell SIGs. Um, are you using Signet rules for basically, are you using Signet to dump all the rules and use that across your environment or not? Sorry, what? Signet rules, basically it's the Jira rules that you can use to then map all the alerts to different systems. Are you using that on your purple team now? No, um, I haven't actually heard of that before, so I wouldn't be able to give you a good answer okay. on that. Yeah, so basically a lot of the, the people that are doing purple teaming and latency and so forth, they set implementation for SIGNA, S-I-J-N-A rules, and basically they use Jira format. You take that rule and then you can convert that into Splunk or any of the sims and whatnot. So it's a popular thing now that teams are doing. Just curious what you were doing. No, that sounds really cool, and I, I feel like that'd be a really good way to, for you to do purple teaming, probably. I think that I missed your question. Yeah. So, if I understand it right, you do a, a, a purple team exercise, then um, fix it as many things as can be fixed. So, actually, fixing as many things as can be fixed is the purple team exercise. We run the test cases as we're developing the fixes. It's the workflow. The workflow really encapsulates the iteration on building the alerts inside of the purple team exercise. So I run one test case, we try to we try an alert. We try the alert, it doesn't work, we try it again. Uh, at what point between teams that's when you ship the fixes? When we are confident in the alert really. So we can talk with our project manager about like what bounds we have on it and that's really what we put into like selecting the test cases and how many test cases that we want to run. Does that make sense? Yeah. It avoids the problem where, where you have a whole list of defects mm -hmm. and, and IT and development teams go, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Are your, are your purple teams, uh, you talked about having kind of a one-to-one -one ratio. So are you, are you cross-training your reds and your blues so that they understand each other's languages a little bit better? Or are you like people to focus real hard on one side or the other. Like the red team goes in, trashes something, finds an example of one thing, and just hands it to the blue team, and then the blue team comes and bothers it once in a while to try to figure out. No, so that's actually what's pretty cool about purple teaming, I feel like, is I've learned a ton about our blue team's tools and like how they go through incident response, how they like build signatures. I've already built a couple myself, actually, using the same tools that they've taught me. Um, I don't know if our blue team is really learning a lot about the malware, since I mostly just take it and like do stuff with it and then run it, but they do figure out sometimes how to obfuscate things while they're trying to figure out what to SIG on, for example. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Anybody else? Okay, thank you so much for having me.